Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. So yeah, thought ya yeah, might like to go to the show to feel the warm thrill of information that this week in science glow. I've got some bad news for you, sunshine. Twist isn't well, it stayed back at the hotel. And they sent us along as a surrogate brand. We're gonna find out where you fans really stand. Are there any minions in the audience tonight? Get them up against the wall. And that one in a lab coat, she don't look right to me. Get her up against the wall. And that one looks bookish. And that one's a geek who let all of this riffraff in off the street. There's one podcasting opinions in the chat room has thoughts. If I had my way, hey, I'd have all of you watch This Week in Science coming up next. Kirsten and Blair. Good science to you too, Justin. What an opening to the show. Are you a little inspired? This I'm week? a little excited. We're going to go see the wall tomorrow. I can't wait. I'm nice. totally stoked. <laughs> that is going to be a good time. But in the meantime, we're not throwing scientists up against the wall. We're not harassing anybody. We're not we're on the side of the good and the science. And that's what we've done. We've brought a whole bunch of science for you, the listener, our minions who are out there today. No need to cry. No need for tears. Just be excited. Maybe you're not going to the wall tomorrow night, but you are here tonight listening to us. So we've got a whole bunch of stories. I brought stories about two different kinds of supernovas, uh, some mouse research, and brains. What did you bring, Justin? Brains! I have got uh, the saddest statistic, uh, really national um, shame story. Uh, alien life discovery. Uh, what is this? Ooh, even safer sex than, uh, than you've, you've even heard of before. And, ooh, Mayan futures. The future of Mayan civilization has been predicted. Ah, very interesting. More predictions, hopefully based on science. And, Blair, and oh, yeah, and, and why, uh, why good cholesterol is bad for you. It could kill you. Oh, no. Ah, nutrition. Oh, cholesterol. Why you the science of nutrition. You <laughs> never so know. Terrible. Right? What'd you bring, Blair? Back by popular demand, I have some information about invertebrate sex. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. And this time it's, it's. Yeah. So last time I know I took some flack because the story was kind of heavy on how the males did not benefit greatly from the experience. But this time I have some females who kind of come out on the raw end of the deal. So All right. we're evening the playing field. Evening it out. We like mm -hmm. things to be fair. All's fair in love and invertebrate sex. <laughs> <laughs> so let's jump into uh, supernovas. There was a study out uh, recently, this last week, um, looking at supernovas. And supernovas, we know the type 1A supernova. It's used as the standard candle for uh, distances in our universe because we know exactly how bright they are, how, how bright they are. And usually about um, 
and and usually and, and because we know how how fast light travels through space, we can use the brightness and the the speed of light to be able to tell us distance. And because type 1A supernovas just they explode with the same intensity pretty much wherever they are, we can use them to be able to measure very accurately or relatively accurately uh, how far away things are in the universe. Question though has been exactly how accurate these measurements are because there have been a couple of different models that physicists have come up with to explain how type 1a supernovas go supernova. What is it that actually causes these stars to explode with such ferocity? And so researchers have, have been debating these two models back and forth and back and forth, and nobody's really been able to, to figure out which one is right until now. And the answer is that both models are right. So uh, a Smithsonian astronomer and Clay fellow, Ryan Foley, um, he's from the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, has been looking at this problem uh, with Robert Kirshner from uh, Klaus Press, Professor of Astronomy at Harvard University. And there are, looking at these two different models, what they call, there are the single degenerate model, or there's a double degenerate model. And in the single degenerate model, a white dwarf sucks up material from a companion star. So it's white dwarf and then another star. And that white dwarf just... <laughs> sucks up material from that store from that star and because of the addition of the additional material from that star it lets it go supernova so a runaway nuclear reaction comes about in the double degenerate model two white dwarf stars merge together and that causes an explosion of the supernova type however uh, the single degenerate systems end up with gas from the companion star around the supernova. So even though uh, the white dwarf has sucked, sucked up the material, the matter of the star, it doesn't suck up all the gas. And so there's leftover gas from the star as a remain around in the remains of the supernova. The de double degenerate systems don't have that gas because, there's an, uh, because of the way that the stars merge. So the, I love the quote here The Robert Kirshner says, just like mineral water, uh, it can be with or without gas. So, so can supernova. Um, so you have a with gas or without gas supernovae. And they looked at a whole bunch of type 1, 1A supernovas to look for signatures of gas. And what did they find? They found some with gas and some without gas. And so they're observation actually supports both models. And now using this information, um, they have to, they, they want to figure out if they really are homogenous enough, if the two types of explosions really are homogenous enough for these supernovas to actually be the standard candle, or if because they are exploding differently, they're different explosions and they shouldn't be considered the same type of explosion. And maybe only, you know, maybe only the exp explosions without gas should be the standard candle or the ones with. And these are questions that the astronomers need to figure out. They don't know exactly why they look so similar from a distance when one's with and one's without and the explosions and the, the starting materials are different. They don't know a whole, they, there's a whole bunch they don't know about these type 1A supernovas. So um, we really need to figure out uh, what's going on with these supernovas. Um, Foley explains, it's if for considering this, uh, these type 1 supernovas like yardsticks for like the standard candle, he says, it's like measuring the universe with a mix of yardsticks and meter sticks. You'll get about the same answer, but not quite. And so he's saying that if they're slightly different and they're not really homogenous, they shouldn't all be type 1A supernovas, that some the accuracy is going to be slightly different and that they, they probably are not exactly the same.
Having been a single degenerate uh, gassy person for a good part of my life. <laughs> yes. I, I would actually, I would, I would suspect that if there's, sh- if the, the signal that they're getting, if the illumination that they're getting seems similar and seems consistent, even though they have different types of uh, uh, supernovas going on, chances are what they're, what they're discovering is that there is a maximum threshold for the amount of an explosion that can be taking place in an area of space. And right. if, that, if there is, if the stand, that's something I which is brilliant for giving standard candles of distance, uh, which means that even if there was more fuel to one supernova versus another, it doesn't matter. It can only explode so much uh, and be so illuminated in one area of space that it's, that it's blowing up in that it doesn't matter how much fuel it is. It reaches a maximum, mm-hmm. and that's our standard candle. That's brilliant. And then, you know, then we got to figure other stuff out. About space beyond that. Right. So maybe there is the, there's a threshold. Right. And so you get enough material to cause a supernova explosion and we, and within a particular range, it doesn't really matter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what you're saying, right? That, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if you've got, uh, at that point, if you've got twice as much fuel or, you know, uh, three times as much, you're only going to be blowing up so much in that, in that region of space. Yeah. The, and then the, the difference when you're, when you're talking about massive distances, if you're, even though a yardstick and a meter stick are technically not that different from each other, when you're just looking at a yardstick and a meter stick, very close, right? Very, very close in terms of how long they are. But still very but difficult to measure distances to supernovas with because. Right. You'd have like, to, it's a lot of <laughs> rolling. I know. Fish really hard and <laughs> take a long time but but it, if you think about that very small difference between the yard and the meter magnified over millions of billions of miles light years i mean you're talking massive differences in accuracy and so if we want to really measure the universe accurately we need to be sure that that the brightness that we're seeing really is the same, no matter what kind of supernova it's coming from. Yeah. Totally. Totally. Yeah, and CR1 in the chat room says, yeah, I don't know, Dr. Kiki, you might want to ask NASA about that incident with Mars. Yeah, but that was, that was, uh, the that was, yeah, I guess that is the yard versus me- mm-hmm. meter oh, stick yeah. metric was system. Standard. It was the same, yeah. yeah. That, was, that, that it was. You are absolutely well. right. <laughs> hey, did you? Um, speaking of Mars, uh, Opportunity Rover is uh, up and running again. Oh, like, I know. <laughs> so awesome! Yay! The little how, rover that how could. How long has this been now? This is, this is like a six years or something. This is crazy. Seven years. Seven years? I don't know. It's yeah, like, it's a it's really long time. Longer than that, I think. Even my goodness, because this would have been. Yeah, yeah, it's about five and a half years. It's five or six, something like that. But this was supposed to be this was supposed to go on for like a couple of months, right? And then it's supposed to be that was it. And now here we are, many many years later, and that plucky robot is still going. Uh, speaking of bright ideas, Vancouver uh, study has found a new model for safer indoor sex workspaces, <clears throat> promoting health and safety for uh, street sex workers there. In Vancouver area. Safety first, we've all heard it, but how often do we practice it if we are peddling sex on the street? Chances are, not every time. Uh, The qualitative evaluation study published this week in the American Journal of Public Health interviewed 39 women living in low-threshold supportive housing programs for sex workers in poverty and using drugs. These programs, operated by a, a women's resource society, the Atria uh, Atira Women's Resource Society and Rain City Housing and Support Society in Vancouver offered an alternative uh, sort of housing program for the street workers. And they, they, were, they went kind of all out here. They had security measures, which included the buildings were uh, women only, uh, not just residents, but the staff. They had guest visitation policies where clients had to sign in at the front desk. Video cameras on site for you know monitoring who's coming and going. Support staff available to call police in case they heard violence. uh, And health and safety resources on site, things like condoms, uh, sanitation, hygiene products, that kind of thing. 
And this is an area where uh, prostitution is is illegal. If I guess if you're outdoors soliciting, you have to be working somewhere. But these are these are people who are really poor, uh, in impo- you know impoverished street workers. It's it's a pretty sad accounting on one hand because this is sort of you're allowing you're making it a little easier so, for somebody to to live the in a lifestyle that this is what they do for money but on the other hand uh it's had some pretty positive impacts at least on on these women who are already in that situation and what are you going to do just ignore it right so so they were they, they were interviewing these people afterward and the, the, it's just such an amazing uh an amazing difference. So they're, what they're talking about, one of the things, it's reduced violence considerably. These women now live in, in housing with other previously street workers, and they're comparing notes, and they've identified, like, a number of serial, like, violent uh, uh, predators. Mm-hmm. They're working with police to root those people out of, out of uh, you know, pred- uh, being predatory towards women. And That's it's awesome. yeah, and you know it's one of these things too. It's like, the, yeah, we know there's there's criminal activity, and we can continue to police it. And you have these women who are not only, not only hiding from you know on the fringes of society, but they're hiding from police. They're they're having to do this work, which is a very you know at risk profession to begin with, uh, in places that were like the prospective client's car or apartment. And anyway, the reports of violence upon them is way down. They're looking at this as a way to prevent uh, sexually trans, uh, transmitted diseases and a host of other things. Well, I think that's something that's something that they uh, in in Nevada when they uh, legalized prostitution, but it is allowed as long as uh, the woman gets tested regu- regularly. Uh, there's there's a structure around it. Uh, there. Are, taxes paid there's there's health monitoring um and they and i believe in nevada they've had they had similar results when they instituted um a lot of the especially the health the health advocacy changes yeah you know i mean it's not this this is one of those things too that this isn't a new situation this isn't a new scenario this isn't a new thing that's what do we, just what popped do, up in our modern society what do we call prostitution the uh, world's oldest, oldest profession, profession right right <laughs> Yeah, it's, it, you know, I mean, just because we don't really approve of it and there are, I mean, by making it illegal, it has marginalized it to the point where yeah. it is in the hands of the criminal underworld. And if you make, you know, if you make it at least, in this case, they haven't legalized anything, but they've got an agreement. The police are no longer uh, harassing the street workers. They're not doing arrests right now. So it's not exactly been legalized, but they are, they're sort of backing off um, prosecuting the the symptom not the not the societal problem i guess it is if that's if that's what you want to call it very interesting i'm so i'm I'm very enthusiastic that somebody's doing a very proactive approach to a problem that actually makes sense and you compare well, that think- to the the uh abstinence only programs that are uh that are taught in some schools as an alternative to sex education and you find that teen pregnancy is actually higher in those areas teaching that. I, so. think, I think looking at, and you look at it from a data perspective and look at it from, you know, the actual, you, you, you institute a change that you can compare to a control, which is either another area that's not, that the change has not been implemented or, um, you know, a past period of time that you collected data. And you can, and you can see whether or not the change has been beneficial. And so scientifically looking at the, the possibility, uh, the possibilities um, is, you know, always beneficial. I mean, always, you know, you find out whether or not what you want to do works or doesn't work. You can implement it further or not. And now the question, now that there's been positive results from this, the question is whether or not more areas will pick up similar uh, solutions to be able to actually have positive change so that there is, you know, less violence towards women greater health within that community of people. Um, you know, there's all sorts of things that could, that choices that need to be made at this point 
whether or not to listen to the data. Right. And this is following uh, Ontario, which uh, I guess is the other, is that the other side of Canada? Had a court of appeals that allows sex workers to legally work in safer indoor uh, spaces starting next year because the court uh, concluded that laws preventing sex workers from working together under one roof or hiring security staff fail to protect sex workers and exacerbate the, the harms. And ultimately, it is your results that were your, mm-hmm. become your intention. Regardless of in, mm-hmm. how you intended something to, to, to go, it's the results that you are actually supporting. So, Yeah. Al- along these lines, there was an interesting uh, result from the STEP study, the HIV vaccine study that's ongoing, mm-hmm. um, that they found that a certain subst- subset of... Uh, of people given the vaccine for a certain period of time, for a, a, a certain number of months, became more likely to, uh, to, to get HIV after getting the vac- vaccination. Wow. They found a, there's a certain subset for the rest of the people. For the rest of the people in the study, it seems to be working. But there's a subset of individuals who they don't exactly understand why. But there's a subset who became more likely to contract HIV. Now, so so the it, uh, once again results. Okay, do we keep giving the vaccine? How do we focus on this small subgroup of people? How do we move forward in um, the this program to try and get a vaccine for this sexually transmitted disease? And and what's kind of interesting too is I wonder if it's I wonder if it's the uh, because, no, I, I don't blame the vaccine right away. This could be a group of people who's like, really? I am now immune to HIV? I'm going to right. go and have lots of unprotected sex with strangers. Like, I mean, I don't know this either. But, like, um, maybe. There, yeah, there, I don't know. I don't know if that's. A, you have that, to come I'm sure contact. that's something they're, look, they're looking at promiscuity and whether or not that changed. Um, but they think that there might be uh, some other underlying genetic factor at play. That made them susceptible to the vaccine? Not to the vaccine, but that combined with the vaccine made them more susceptible to the virus. But they would still be having to have the the sexual intercourse with... Yes, they would be doing... Unprotected from the... I mean, that's how, right? I mean, it's not a a toilet seat, right? Okay. Compared to a control... Compared to a control, um, if their promiscuity is not different from the control... There's, you know, something inherent within this subgroup of people, wow. which is pretty interesting. But anyway, that's just a sideline. I thought it was just a fascinating yeah, thing that I ran across this week. Blair. Blair's got invertebrates for Blair's us. Blair's Animal Corner with Blair you- works at a zoo, likes hippos. <laughs> and if you just tuned in, you are listening to Twist. All right, so we were just talking about Vancouver and Ontario. I have a study from Montreal. Hey. <laughs> nice. McGill University looked at pond skaters. That's Rheumatobates rileyi. And the they looked at false color electron micrographs of high speed video. And they saw that the males have really elaborate antennae compared to the females. And they flash froze some of their subjects in the mating process and checked them out up close. And they noticed that the males were seeing that these special antennae were perfectly restricting the female heads in place. So they actually match the contours of the female's head and they can successfully mate with even the most resistant of females. Oh, great. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) The reason they had to Mm. evolve this in the end was because the females, after one mating attempt, they can store sperm for their entire life. They're in, yeah. So. They're not super long-lived creatures, but still. (laughs) It's not long. They're a bug. (laughs) But (laughs) they don't need multiple mating events. They just need one. And so it's, the, the further mating, it's not necessary to them. And in fact, having the male on top of them actually decreases their feeding success and increases their vulnerability to 
predators and other things. Mm -hmm. But so it's a, as far as they're concerned, they'd rather just have the one event and be done. <laughs> but that's not to the male's advantage because maybe she made it with one male and another male wants to get in the game. So right. they have these special antennae. Because you all you end up at a certain point if you with multiple males there at a certain level there's sperm competition. Right, and which so, is a whole other bag of right. Problems. So if you have if you have an an animal, an invertebrate in this case, who's storing sperm, then that that female can store the sperm from several males. Right. And then when she finally decides to lay eggs and uh, and allow the sperm to contact the eggs, right. then you want to be as you know, a part of that mix. Right, exactly. Yeah. Part of it is better than not part of it at all. Yeah. So th what's really interesting, though, is that they found out that the antennae development in the males was controlled by one single gene. And this is where it gets really cool. They manipulated the gene in larvae and created specimens with varying stages of antennae development. And then they studied their reproductive success. And each step further in the development, they had highly increased mating success, which makes sense. Mm -hmm. But they could see exact causality there. So they could really separate it out and say, yes, this is actually increasing their mating success. And if you look at the structures, especially um, the link on our site, or you guys can see it now if you're watching the video, it's really very different from a sensory antenna. It's large, it's muscular, they can actually, they can use force with it, which a normal pair of antennae, you would never be able to do that with. So that was really cool that they they actually evolved a way to get past that the female resistance, which you know I I think is cool <laughs> in this context at least. I don't know why, but like the idea of the of the antenna being used to lock in the females. <laughs> Head. It made, for some reason, it made me think of figure skaters, like getting their skates locked together. <laughs> I don't, so I'm like, I'm currently looking up images oh, of figure skaters online, trying to see if I can. <laughs> anyway. Well, shall I go to the other one? <laughs> yes. Okay. Now for the other All invertebrate right. story. So at Umea University, they looked at warehouse pirate bugs, Xylochorus flav flavipes, and... These bugs, along with other insects, exhibit something called traumatic insemination. That sounds fun, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's when the male will pierce and penetrate his mate through her body wall. Ouch. And inject sperm. <laughs> and obviously that comes at a great physi physiological cost to the female because she can get infected and she's getting injured in the process. Not good for overall health. No. no. And the females, I guess they're very picky in this species, mm -hmm. or at least they were. <laughs> yeah, they were. And, and so the females would turn down a lot of males and now the males can just kind of... Now the males are just like, I stab you. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. And... What they were looking at was if it's so costly to female survival, how is this something that stayed and has made it through? If if females are dying, how are we still making larvae? Right. right. So what they found was that alongside with traumatic insemination, other things evolve in the females. Like the these females have developed completely new organs that help to prevent infection. Oh. Another thing they noticed is that females die young because of this, but they will often lay more eggs each day before they die. And so what they're looking at right now is if that's something that the females just do or if that's actually affected by chemicals coming from the male through the process. Hmm. <laughs> So they don't know the answer to that yet. Yeah. But it makes sense that if you're going to injure your female in the mating process, 
which I would not recommend. Keep this in mind. There has to be other ways for the female to overcome that hardship in order to stay evolutionarily viable, I guess. Right, because if you, as a as a species, if the male is killing the females in the process of yeah. mating and um, in and in the process making it impossible for the females to get to the point of laying eggs, uh-huh. you know, that's number one, you don't want to do that. Or it they the female lays eggs, but maybe not enough eggs right. for the offspring, for enough offspring to be born because um, mortality is often very, very high right. in young. Yeah. So well, plus yeah, if- there are all sorts of places where it's just, the injuring the female. Yeah. yeah. That's not that's a, a good call. A, yeah. In, but it's but it's interesting. <laughs> but if you that, don't if you don't stab her, she's not gonna lay eggs. Right. That's in that's the, well, geez, it's so, traumatic and it does it have to be traumatic insemination? A, no. So there's an ele- evolutionary crossroads if you think about it. So some of these bugs back in the day were trying to impress the female, and some of them decided to just stab her. <laughs> and one of those two ended up going the better way. So in most species, the males have to impress the female to mate. But in this one, the males took a different route. (laughs) Right. So in this in this particular species, it's always traumatic. It's just the way it is. Yeah, I think it is. It's and they're not the and they're 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 probably not the only example of this kind of of insemination. That this is probably something that has happened repeatedly. And so yeah. now, you know, to look across different species and figure out if uh females uh always compensate in the same ways or if there are really unique adaptations depending on the species. Right. And so that's what they said is they did compare them to some other species that employ traumatic insemination such as the parasitic bed bug and they u- yeah they usually all of these species that use traumatic insemination will have some sort of side by side um female coping mechanism i guess and so mm-hmm. they did see a lot of the same ones like these organs that help with um preventing infection too in multiple species that are totally unrelated. This is fascinating. You think humans are complicated? Yeah. Bugs. Bugs are complicated. I don't know. It makes me happy. It's interesting. It's really (laughs) interesting. Well, it's interesting to find out about all these, you know, different, the the different ways that things have evolved in nature and the different solutions that different species have come up with to different problems. There's things we don't even know about yet. Yeah. In the world of things like invertebrate sex. <laughs> so much more to find out. I'm just so curious. <laughs> we need more invertebrate sex voyeurism. <laughs> I want to see some pond world? skater on orb spider action. Oh, yeah, that would be. <laughs> Interspecies action. What? That, that would be rough. The female that detaches the male's... <laughs> Organ against the male that <laughs> stabs the female. Stabs with the male. That'd be quite I, a cage match. I think I'm. I think I see a new Discovery Channel <laughs> program. <laughs> oh man! All right. So, uh, final story for the first half of the show. It's. It's a result of sex, but not necessarily about sex. So. Um, in the process of reproduction, DNA has to be uh, recombined, copied, and you know gets passed on to the offspring. In the process of reproduction, sometimes mistakes happen. Um, mistakes in that copying of the DNA uh, that ends up being passed along. And sometimes those mistakes um, actually stick around and they confer benefits to the offspring and they end up being really great. And one of those mistakes might have made a, made us, given us the brain that we have now. The wonderful, complex, modern human brain might have been the result of a simple copying error that occurred at some point in history. Um, 
And in this, uh, this error, it was probably a duplication error. So uh, DNA copying machinery needs to copy part of the genome, but for whatever reason, they get the, it gets stuck, the machinery goes back, copies it again, and you end up with two copies of a gene when you only need one. Um, but it's, uh, it, in this study, researchers at the Scripps Institute found that these duplications, there are lots of duplications that exist in the human genome. They found that a lot of them actually play a role in the developing brain, and there are about 30 of these genes and uh, the, some of these 30 genes are some of the most recent of our genetic uh, changes or additions. They looked at one particular gene called SRGAP2, SIRGAP2, and they think it was duplicated a couple of times during evolution. Once about three and a half million years ago, again, two and a half million years ago. The second duplication, two and a half million years ago, doesn't seem complete. So when they look at the sequences uh, of nucleotides in the in the genome, in DNA, you see SIRGAP2, it seems to be there normally. There's a one duplication that is normal and another duplication where it's almost the complete sequence for the gene, but not quite. So it's a partial duplication. And they think that that partial duplication might somehow be the key. They took this gene and they got it to be expressed in the, in the mouse genome. So they created genetically modified mice. They uh, created... Uh, Sentient mice? No, they created Sentient brain they cells. Sentient finally did it? <laughs> this, is, this is the really interesting question. Um, but they... they were able to introduce the SIRGAP2 gene and the partial duplication into neuronal cells of uh, mice. And they got these, uh, these brain cells to develop. And what seems to happen in human development is this SIRGAP2 um, seems... The human brain cells have a lot of spines on them, and the spines allow them to connect to other neurons. And uh, during development, there's a lot of really fast growth and connection to other neurons. The mouse neurons with this SIRGAP2 added to them, the incomplete duplication of SIRGAP2, were very similar to human brain cells. Looked very similar with more spines and they also grew a lot faster um, and seemed to have a lot of aspects that uh, human brain cells have. The actually creating sentient mice part of the equation, that hasn't happened yet. So there's no way of knowing whether um, if we were to add this to mice and actually let them develop and see them um, as fully grown adult mice, whether or not the the mouse, the mice and rats of Nim would take place. Shouldn't we try? <laughs> Maybe. I mean, shouldn't we be trying? I mean, we should be trying. I mean, aren't they trying? Maybe they're tr this, tell me they're maybe trying. Maybe this lab is working on that next. I don't know. I didn't talk to them personally. So it, I think it's a fascinating question. And I, I would love awesome. to know if adding SIRGAP, this partial duplication of SIRGAP2, would change the mouse brain enough to let them be just a bit smarter. Maybe not sentient, but just a bit smarter than the normal mouse. Yeah, I think we should introduce this to lots of creatures and find out <laughs> if it works. Yeah, Maybe right. not those damn apes, but uh, everything else. Yeah. Like dolphins? Let's, 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 I mean, dolphins are already pretty smart. They've got lots of little... Let's make them like, even smarter. Yeah, can you imagine? We could actually have somebody who could do excavations out. under the sea, deep under the sea for us. That's right. That's totally right. rad dolphin <laughs> scientists. If you need more dolphin scientists or rats of Nim in your life, stay tuned. For the second half of this show, Twist will be back in just a few moments with more great science news. Shows the 
Audible.com is the leading provider of audiobooks. With over 100,000 titles in their library on all sorts of different topics, we are sure that you will find something that you will enjoy listening to. Sure of it. Sure of it. Something scientific, if you like science. Something fun and frivolous, if that's more your style. But, you know, I don't care. All I care about is that you get a free download if you go to audiblepodcast.com slash twist. That's right. Go to audiblepodcast.com slash twist and you can get a free audiobook download. Try out a free membership subscription to the Audible library. Check it out. See if you like it. It's easy. Free. Sign up. Audiblepodcast.com slash twist. Now. Additionally, Twist has merchandise that you might enjoy. So head on over to twist.org to purchase our 2010 Science Music Compilation CD. Or, and, you could do or, or, and, and, or, a World Robot Domination t-shirt. That's right. Get your own t-shirt. World Robot Domination. They are coming and they will rule the world. It's true. It's true. Twist science compilation CD and a world robot domination t-shirt. Get these gifts, buy them for yourself and support twists in the process. Additionally, if you don't really like merchandise, you don't need another t-shirt or another CD. We like donations. Twist is supported by listeners like you and your, don your donations pay for our hosting, our bandwidth, contractors we need to hire and fun things that we try to do, the, do for the show occasionally. And we really do appreciate any amount that you're able to give $5, 5000 5 million. I know there are some generous folks out there, right? You make this show possible and we accept donations through PayPal currently on our website. You go to twist.org. Go to any of the show pages. Go to the most recent show page. Listen to the show, make a comment in the comment section, and click on one of the little pink buttons. Little pink buttons. Easy, so easy to make a donation. You can make a one-time donation, a recurring donation. You don't even need to think about it, really. And buy a CD. Bye, bye. Donate, donate. We thank you for your support. We really couldn't do it without you. And we're back with more this week in science. That's right. Justin, what did you bring for this uh, second half of the you show? Want the saddest statistic in our national uh, national conscience here? I don't like sad things, but okay, give it to me. 2009 study. Children with public insurance were uh, three times more likely, and children with no insurance were 11 times more likely not to have a primary care physician when compared with children with private insurance. Without primary care physician, the emergency department often becomes the primary point of contact for treatment and diagnoses. I don't know if you can imagine taking a child to a, an emergency room, uh, especially if you're in a large metropolitan area. It is a frightening place to take a kid who's already nervous about going to see a doctor for whatever's ailing them to see an emergency room in a major city in America. Uh, this is a new study scheduled for publication in the Journal of Pediatrics. It's a report that children with private, public, and no insurance may receive completely different levels of treatment. This is uh, Rebecca Mannix, MD, MPH, which I don't know what that means. Uh, colleagues from Children's Hospital Boston retrospectively assessed 84,536 emergency, uh, emergency department visits of children 18 years of age and younger in the span of 1999 to 2008 using National Hospital Ambulatory Medical Care Surveys, uh, which is an annual support of 480 emergency departments 
over a 10-year period, researchers found that 45% of children uh, in the in the emergency rooms had private insurance. 43% had public, and uh, 12% had no insurance. Compared with children with private insurance, those with public or no insurance were almost 25% less likely than those with private insurance to undergo testing, receive a medication, or undergo any procedure when seeking care. That is uh, pretty insane. All the children with uh, public insurance were 20% more likely to be diagnosed with a significant illness compared to children with private insurance. There was no difference in the level of treatment based on insurance status among children with significant illness. That's at least um, encouraging. But it sounds like they have to... Doctors on the scene are perhaps having to diagnose more significant disease in order to get treatment. Is that what that sounds like? Yeah. Yeah. It's unclear whether these insurance-based differences represent under-treatment of children without private insurance or over-treatment of children with private insurance or appropriate care for all. Uh, But it looks pretty clear if you (laughs) read the numbers. That's disgusting, people. That is the sickest thing. And it's always the thing you hear about when when you're hearing about the health care arguments in this country is that. It's people's choice whether or not they want to be insured. You can buy insurance, just purchase it for yourself. But it's, of course, those parents who can't afford the insurance passing on that poverty, sharing that poverty with their children, of course. Absolutely disgusting. That's the worst thing I've read in a really long time. (laughs) I'm sorry. (laughs) That was probably not not the best kickoff to the second half of the show. Uh, No, but I'm I'm uh, just thinking about the the information, and it's not uh, necessarily... uh, huge surprise i mean you you want to think that everybody especially children uh is getting this the same level of care but that's not you know not always the case and in especially in an emergency room situation versus oh i'm going to take my child in to see a primary care physician i'm going specifically to my pediatrician versus I'm going to go to the emergency room where the emergency room staff is overworked. Other people who don't have insurance are using the ER as a uh, a way to get into the health system to get things uh, uh, helped out. I mean, it's it's unfortunate, and I'm not necessarily surprised at the discrepancy, but it's important that somebody has made these measurements and is actually is publicizing them. And, and you know what, I, I, I guess it's partly because I'm just too optimistic about the way things actually work, <laughs> that I, I wouldn't think that um, no care w- could take place if something was diagnosed or if something was, was, was noticed. I would think that any hospital in the, in the country would take care of a child, insurance be damned. And I guess that's just mm-hmm. insanely overly optimistic of me. But I thought that's what that profession did in terms of children. And I, yeah. I guess it's not true, and I didn't really know. But in terms of uh, something that is uh, a dire illness, it is true. You know, that people, and that, I mean, it. doctors, hospitals all over, if it's something that is really, really bad <laughs> that the child is ailing from, they're going to help and take care of that kid. Mm-hmm. no matter who that kid is. If it's something like a common cold, maybe they are not going to uh, pay it as much attention. Once again, because of the uh, just the the number of, of people and cases that they have to deal with. I'm not making excuses for anyone, but at the, you know, at the same time there are probably lots of factors that that feed into this. That could be. And, you know, the other thing is maybe that emergency room is also diagnosing these dire cases because there is no primary physician mm-hmm. to have found them and discovered them and to be right. treating them already. To catch them early. Right. Exactly. So we just wait till it's it's a serious illness. I don't know. I just. Yeah. Ugh. Ugh. <laughs> I, yeah, I agree. I think that's I think that explains uh, that. I think that is just the best response right there. <laughs> <laughs> Exasperation. <laughs> what more can we do? We can, we, well, there's there are solutions, but you know it's yeah. one of those things. I'm I'm get I'm getting really fed up with the debate in this country about healthcare because it that is to me that's more important than than national security in the way at least that that's approached and funded. And I think it is I think it is a national security issue, 
actually. It's yeah. much more important to me than the, you know, homeland security thing is is treating millions of children across this, this nation. Way yeah. more important. Priorities are just jacked up right now. Yeah. I, w- I will agree. Priorities are jacked up. <laughs> <laughs> Deep thoughts with Justin. Priorities in this country. Jacked up. That's what jacked it is. Jacked up. <laughs> um, okay, moving forward for uh, some more up upbeat and light, uh, light, lively, fun stories, I guess. Um, how about this one out of the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences? Diana Tamir... Uh, led this study looking at the brains of people uh, and how they were activated while they talked about themselves. Mm -hmm. They found that uh, people like to talk about themselves. (laughs) So they found that regions of the brain that are activated by Uh, food, sex, money, drug addiction, all of the kind of, um, ooh, this is exciting, the thrill-seeking parts of the brain uh, were activated when people talked about themselves. And it's estimated that 30 to 40% of your speech has to do with you. Uh, Mm. Tamir says, self-disclosure is a behavior that we do all of the time, day in, day out. When you talk to people, they'll often often talk about themselves on Twitter and Facebook. People are primarily posting about what they're thinking and feeling in the moment. This is one piece of evidence about why we might do that. Uh, In the study, they uh, had 78%, in one part of the study, they had 78 participants disclose their opinions about things that they liked. So... I like coffee, or I like tea, or I like beer, or I like wine, and then judge the opinions of other people's, of other people, uh, while they looked at their photographs. Um, Another experiment, they had 117 people talk about their personality traits, uh, and then those of a U.S. president at the time, which was either George Bush or Barack Obama, uh, and they found that certain parts of the brain were more active when they talked about themselves than when they talked about other individuals or when they were judging other individuals. Um, and the the questions that this brings up is how is, of why our brain evolved this way to stimulate us to enjoy talking about ourselves and what does that mean for relating to others so as a social creature is it good for us to talk about ourselves to a certain degree um to uh to be able to connect with other people and so um one one researcher who's not involved in the in the study said that uh, if Animals do this kind of stuff, disclosing information about themselves with smells and movements, pheromones, and humans do it with language. And so this is something to uh, motivate social behavior, possibly. So I have a question. They just did this study recently, right? Yeah. It would be, I would be interested to see if before social media happened, if the number was lower. That, I think that would be really interesting. They haven't, I mean, there's, I don't think there's any way to really no. go back. I mean, the only thing that you could do is look at people who use social media versus people who don't use social yeah. media or um, introduce introduce people who are naive to social media mm-hmm. to social media during right. the study to see what kind of an effect it has. Yeah. I don't, I, yeah. It would also be interesting to see <laughs> different <laughs> social classes too because if you think about people in third world countries who don't know if they're going to eat today they might be less inclined to speak about themselves and that takes another another thing cultural a cultural um perspective into it western culture yeah. is probably much more likely to be open and speaking about yourself Mm -hmm. than another culture. So is it is Eastern culture, which is much more private and reserved? Mm -hmm. How would they uh, respond within this study? And I'm, 
I'm going to bet that this study didn't go out and get no, individuals from not. all over the world in different cultures. I mean, no, the most, most of psychology is, is based on the Western world. I mean, it's Western psychology. I mean, mm -hmm. that, yeah. it, that's what it's focused on, really. Well, but I, even I would say maybe 40, 50 years ago, it was considered impolite to talk too much about yourself. Mm hmm. Well, yeah, and there's, there still is that, that yeah. like, oh, she, that person talks about themselves all the time. You know, people do yeah. get annoyed at that kind of trait. But, but this, is, this isn't new. Um, this, is, this is long standing. This is a, a primary thing that you do in sales, is, um, in the auto business especially, is you get people talking about themselves. Uh, and, and they do. They will, they will tell you their life story to their car salesman, to their bartender, uh, to whoever they've got as a captive audience. And and they feel really good about doing it. It's very ther therapeutic. I mean, people pay shrinks lots of money so they can sit there and talk about themselves endlessly. And they feel so good that they're willing to pay a couple hundred dollars an hour and do it in weekly or biweekly sessions. You know, so I don't I don't think it predates the, the um, social medias. Yeah. I just think people might do it more freely since, you know, some it's, people it's want now. That's, some, that's, people, that's awesome. <laughs> some people think that I want to know what they had to eat for lunch via yeah. social media. I just think it, it's maybe a lot of the stigma of talking about yourself has released since oh, yeah. this has come that's, about. Oh modern you, psychology differences. Wait, is, or is this what psychology is really like? <laughs> like when you go, like, is that what people talk about when they lie down on the couch? They're like, yeah, today I had this great chicken sandwich. I ate it. I felt it really <laughs> terrific. Then I got this coffee at this new shop. Is that what it is? Because that would be worth, then I could see why they charge what they charge. If they had to there listening to all the, the minutia of the day. Yeah. That's what I used to, I used to make my living listening to people's Twitter updates. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and a second really quick study that I thought was just fascinating, a uh, study looking at the brains of people who had been convicted of murder, rape, and violent assaults and had w uh, been psychologically uh, diagnosed with, uh, with uh, what was the, what, did, what disorders, antisocial behavior disorder, uh, personality disorders, and and other individuals who had been diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder, disorders plus uh, psychopathy, and then also healthy non-offenders. They imaged the brains of the of these of these people and found that psychopaths have structural differences to their brains. So the brains of psychopaths are different. Um, so people who uh, commit these heinous crimes that everybody can say, well, wow, how did they, how do, how do they do that? I could never, what? How, I can't even understand that. They don't, uh, psychopaths do not feel the same emotional connection to other individuals. They do not feel the same no uh, remorse. They don't have empathy uh, because their brains are actually structured differently. And so what this has implications for is uh, a therapy and the actual treatment for these disorders. So individuals who have antisocial personality disorder for say a psychological reason, you know, that they, they had um, environmental uh, or relationship uh, th uh, things that led them to become antisocial, but not psychopathic, um, they, those individuals can still benefit from therapeutic intervention to help them to recover and maybe not rape or have violent acts again in the future. However, individuals who are psychopaths, their brains are different. And so such therapy, the same kind of therapy might not be successful at all. And so there might, uh, it suggests that we should probably be looking at these individuals Lock differently in terms up. of <laughs> in terms of behavior. And if we do want to try and get people to re-enter like this, to re-enter society or to work with them within society, how can we uh, work with individuals who have a different brain structure? We don't. We, we, we lock them up. There's, there's the first significant good reason for locking somebody up, preventative crime, uh, is we give everybody <laughs> the test. Everybody gets How the about test. You just treat them before they hurt someone instead. Right. Well, yeah, but lock them up right. first. 
Because, <laughs> well, you know, yeah, what's that, before? Yeah, that sounds like a really... Uh, what's before? What does before mean? If we, have, if we have physiological proof that their brain structure is going to allow them to be in this category, I say that's, uh, that's the sort of thing that we need to keep this country safe. And we should, we should be proactive about it. Everybody gets the test. Uh, if you fail, if you don't have empathy for your fellow human being, as a fellow human being, I say uh, lock you up. And I think that is pre crime. Of- it is pre crime. Absolutely, I think it's, it's pre crime. It's pre crime. When you want to solve a crime, you want to solve it ahead of time. Teens involved. It's yeah. I think this is this is fodder for debate, and I can't wait to hear what people what people uh, say if Locking we get emails up. or comments back on this story. I I just brought it up as a scientific story of interest and now there's it but i think the thing is we have scientific evidence like this so how do we use it do we go the route of lock them up this is a debate that should happen this is a a debate that people should be interested in because this kind of scientific research is going to uh, determine how our lives are lived in the future so I think this is I think this is really really interesting where science uh, one of the interesting interfaces of where science meets, meets culture. Do you have any more stories, Justin? Oh, lots of them. Uh, painted calendars have been discovered going well beyond 2012. A lost city built by the ancient Maya and discovered nearly a century ago. So how lost could that be? Has been found uh, to be an accurate prediction of the past and perhaps the future. So excavating for the first time in the sprawling complex of Sultan in the Guatemala's Penton region, archaeologists have uncovered a structure that contains what appears to be workspace for the town's scribe. Its walls are adorned with unique paintings, one uh, depicting a lineup of men in black uniforms. And by uniforms, they're wearing, like, loincloths and all have a similar, like, feather that they're wearing, which is odd, they're saying here, because it's the first time they've seen sort of uniformed looking dress uh, in any of the depictions of the Mayans. And along with this are hundreds and hundreds of scrawled numbers, calculations relating to the Maya calendar. On the wall of one structure, thought to be a house, is a covered with tiny millimeter thick red and black glyphs, unlike any seen before any other Maya sites. Some of these uh, represent various calendrical cycles, (laughs) Uh, charted by the Maya, the 260-day ceremonial calendar, 365-day solar calendar. There seems to be a huge emphasis throughout all of these in uh, sort of trying to determine when the solar eclipses will take place. That's a very important date that they, 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 uh, they're, they're tracking. What's kind of interesting, it's whenever the Maya calendar ends, it doesn't end like that's the end of time. It ends as in... That's the end of that calendar, and it starts a new one. And the example given here by one of the researchers, Anthony Aveni, professor of astronomy and anthropology at Colgate University, uh, it's like when you roll over the numbers in a car, or which doesn't happen anymore. But it's, it's like when the numbers used to roll over, and you'd go up to 100,000 and would start over at one again. I wonder if, like, the old, uh, if, if the Mayans, the ancient Mayans, you know, had, had, a, had a party every time... There was a, a new calendar rollout. It's been 400 years. Yeah, let's have a party. If there, if there was some significance at all to the calendar rolling over, if it was just something that happened. You know, because we have New Year's Eve every year. We had at the change of the century, it was a big, you know, 99 to 2000 was a really big year to uh, to celebrate. I just I just wonder if that human uh, need to celebrate uh, was is consistent. I, I bet it is. I mean, that's a very human thing to want to, you know, have a party for a significant event, right? Yeah, Goldisator says, Mayan parties involved human sacrifice. Exactly. So they're like, woo, party! Where's my sword? Time to sacrifice a virgin. Nice. Yeah, this, this is a, there's, there's this one uh, funny part I'm trying to find in here where they were, is it the one where they're tracking the phases of the moon? Oh, yeah, so they found numbers that were tracking, uh, tracking the phases of the moon. Right, and it was like it's scrawled numbers all over this huge all calculations going on all over the place. 
they were trying to reconcile uh, somehow reconcile their grand unification theory, right? Reconciling lunar periods with the solar calendar. If we could just get the two calendars to the, to the right, we could discover something huge, the grand unification of of sun and moon. And uh, they, they said there's this one part where uh, they're looking looking to predict eclipses where you've got these really nice numerical notes painted in red, uh, and then next to them there's a whole bunch of corrections. <laughs> like, So it's even then, even the Mayans didn't write stuff in stone even when they wrote stuff in stone. They painted corrections <laughs> next to them. I love it. They, they're, that's, that's science right there. Here's the calculations. They missed it by a couple days. Okay, let's go back, add a little bit of math. Uh, what's also interesting in this, there are calendars they found in this that reflect a completely different worldview than they have been portraying, uh, un, you know, in the in the by basically newscasters. I don't know who else has been talking about that the world's going to end. I've, I only hear it from from like local newscasters. The Mayan calendar says, right? The uh, they have dates, important dates, that reach seven thousand years from now on into the future. <laughs> Uh, and very much unlike uh, us looking for hidden messages at the end of the world in Mayan calendars, Mayans were making calendars that looked pretty much like a guarantee that the future would be the future as it was then and that it would never change. <laughs> they had, they had, I mean, they really had yeah. plans for parties 7,000 years from now. And that was just... and that's, and. and that's just this one calendar. I mean, it's very right. possible they just they were calculating out beyond seven thousand years, and we just haven't seen those calendars yet. You know, I mean, I, I, Kirsten, I like it. It's, preemptively it's trying to stop the end of the world theory seven thousand years from now. <laughs> yeah, preemptively debunking the seven thousand. Right. I, I am I am future. debunking that to <laughs> yeah yeah. Yep. The end of the world, uh, It's that that party's not going to happen in 7,000 years. It's not happening December 21st, 2012. It's not happening in 7,000 years. It's Sorry, kids. But I hope to have a not the end of the world party, right? It should be a good time. I think I think we, we should have a big celebration. It'll be a lot of fun. Yeah. <gasps> yeah. Oh, I had one more story for the hour, but you know what? It is time to... Is it is it really time? I had one more too. I just kind of read this yeah. line. This is she's talking about uh, you know maybe maybe there's life in uh, uh, outer space uh, out there other life, but uh, we should just probably make it here. It's more likely uh, less likely that we're going to uh, discover uh, a distant world like Columbus did, and much more likely that life will be to, uh, invented by a Geppetto on Earth. He's toiling oh, over his workbench. I love that. I that's think, interesting. I think humans are lonely. And long for another form of life in the universe, says uh, Dr. Joyce. Yeah. Anyway, uh, um, Dr. Joyce, you're so pessimistic. I'm, that's just, that makes no, me... no, I like I like what she's saying. It's going to be a, the, the new, when we discover life, it'll Pinocchio. be a Pinocchio, right? Mm -hmm. And not the... Uh, yeah. I, I like it. I just want to be a normal little boy. Um, <laughs> in terms of life, um, our own life, this, this study is um, a suggestion that to understand our microbial health, maybe we need to measure it daily. Uh, research looking at the vaginal microbiome of a bunch of women found that it changed a lot over time and the it's a really dynamic system and the whole idea of certain types is a, a, a microbiome type is not necessarily the way it is that um, there are other factors at play and that there's these are ecosystems we are an ecosystem we are a magical magical ship for life <laughs> it's gonna be hard to hard to pin it down but maybe you know as the, as the title from this blog says, to keep yourself healthy, brush, floss, and measure your microbes every day. <laughs> it might be gargle. Gargling. Gar Can you Never gargle? Mind. Take a swab. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, thank you, everybody, for enjoying today's show. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it. Twist is available as a podcast. Just Google us in the iTunes directory. And you can subscribe and listen to shows dating back seven plus years now. Hundreds and hundreds, several hundred shows are in the books. If you have an Android device, you can look for Twist for Droid. 
That's an app in the uh, marketplace. Twist, the number four droid app in the Android marketplace. And we're Twist on the iPhone. And for more information on anything that you've heard here today, show notes are going to be available on our website, which is twist.org, T-W-I-S dot org. We also want to hear from you, so send us an email, Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com or Justin at thisweekinscience.com. Be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, somewhere in the subject line or your email will be spam filtered into oblivion. You can also reach us on the Twitter, at Dr. Kiki, at Jacksonfly, at Twist Science, at Blair's Man Menage Man Menagerie. <laughs> You're going to get this it word one of these so days. hard. <laughs> Blair's Menagerie. Uh, there we we love your feedback. No place with this animal. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a subject uh, for discussion, an interview person, even, that would be groovy. Send it on to us. Groovy. And we'll be back here next week, and we hope that you will join us once again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from today's show, remember... It's all in your head. <laughs> this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. This week science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news That what I say may not represent your views But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan If you listen to the science you may just yet understand That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy, jeopardy, jeopardy. And this week in science is coming your way so everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our meth instead of rolling a die We may rid the world of toxoplasma Gandhi, aye, 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 aye. Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. science. list of items I want to address from stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought and I'll try to answer any question you've got but how can I ever see the changes I seek when I can only set up shop one hour a week this week in science is coming your way you better just listen to what we say and if you've learned anything that we said, then please just remember it's all in your head. Cause it's this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, 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 science. science. this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, 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 science. science. this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, this week in science. This week in science. This week in science.